It's a really tremendous honor for me to welcome everyone to this celebration of the 30th anniversary of the triumph of solidarity in Poland and of Lech Wałęsa's stirring address to a joint session of the Congress on November the 15th, 1989. The victory of solidarity was a monumental achievement that brought communism to an end in Poland and the rest of Central Europe and changed the course of world history. This is indeed an achievement that is worth celebrating, even though, as we've been repeatedly reminded in the media, it did not bring an end to history, nor did it end the struggle for democracy, freedom, and the rule of law. That struggle continues today in Central Europe and everywhere else because no one can ever take freedom for granted. The price of liberty, as we know, is eternal vigilance. At our conference tomorrow, we will discuss the continuing challenges to democracy that exist in Poland and Hungary and other countries in Central Europe. But tonight, we want to say thank you to Lech Wałęsa and to let him know that we have not forgotten the importance of that moment in 1980 when he jumped over that shipyard wall in Gdansk to join his fellows. He had been fired, so he was rejoining them as colleagues, and to create the first free trade union and actually really the first independent institution of any kind in the communist world. I want to thank our sponsors this evening, the AFL-CIO, the Bricklayers and Steelworkers Union, Bignef Kranowski, and the Polish American Freedom Foundation, which is the institution that was created with the legacy funds from the Congress's Support for East European Democracy Act, run by Jerzy Kosminski, a friend of a lot of people here who was Poland's ambassador to the United States. I also want to thank for their assistance in organizing this reception, the Lech Wałęsa Institute, the Civic Development Forum in Poland, which is run by Leszek Balcerowicz, who will be speaking tonight, the Kassler Institute, and also the artist Tom Marsh, who did the wonderful woodcut of the Goddess of Democracy from Tiananmen Square that we will present to Lech Wałęsa later this evening. As we reflect on the significance of Solidarity's struggle, I want to remember people who are no longer with us but who played a critical role in supporting Solidarity's struggle for democracy. Most of all, I want to remember Lane Kirkland, the president of the AFL-CIO, whose support for Solidarity throughout the 1980s was uncompromising and decisive. We created the NED's Democracy Service Medal in April 1989 to honor Lane and Lech Wałęsa together on the 10th anniversary of the success of the roundtable and negotiations that led to Poland's breakthrough elections the following June and the eventual fall of the communist regime. Lane was gravely ill at the time. He died less than four months later. And I'll never forget that Lech Wałęsa passed up a big dinner to visit Lane at his home. Their collaboration and friendship embodied everything that solidari the solidarity struggle was all about. I also want to remember Jan Novak Jezuranski, who was not only a famous Polish hero, but also Ned's indispensable advisor for its program of grants to independent Polish organizations other than solidarity. We supported Solidarity, but Jan advised us on everything else and everything that we did, really. He, he, he was a very forceful personality. And I also want to remember the great Polish intellectual, Leszek Kolakowski, who represented in exile OCNO, the Committees for Independent Culture, and communicated to us all of its priorities for funding. There was also, of course, Big Brzezinski, who was both an advisor and a member of the NED board and who helped shape our approach to Poland and, and to the rest of the Central European region. Finally, I want to remember Nadia Duke, who died last January and who oversaw NED's programs in Poland and the other Soviet bloc countries. I want to remember Tom Kahn, who directed the AFL-CIO's International Affairs Department during the Solidarity Years 
And finally, I want to re remember Jacek Kalabinski, a journalist and himself a freedom fighter who translated for Lech Wałęsa during his historic visit to the United States in 1989, and who was famously called the voice of Lech Wałęsa. We're thrilled to have Jacek's widow, Barbara Kalabinski, with us tonight. Over there, Barbara, thank you for being with us. I don't believe has, ah, okay, great. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Judy. You're on the hill, you just gotta go with the flow when you're on the hill. I wanna introduce our first speaker, which is Congressman Elliot Engel, who is the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and it's because of Elliot Engel that we have this room tonight. He's our host, he arranged for us to have this room, and I want him to know how grateful we are. He is a tireless advocate for the values of freedom and democracy that shape, and we want to have shape, our foreign policy. And he's been a reliable friend of the NED for, for many, many years, and he's been outspoken on the importance of our country's commitment to the democratic principles and ideals during the struggle for democracy in Central Europe, and then since that struggle, when the, struggle, when the battle for democracy continues. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce Elliot Engel, who's chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Good to see you. Good to see you. Well, good evening, everybody. It's, uh, it's welcome to the uh, House Foreign Affairs Committee. It's great to have you all here uh, in our wonderful room. I noticed one of my predecessors, the former chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, is here. And I'd like her to say hello. So, um, and I want to again, again, uh, say to all of you, uh, it's a pleasure really to, to have you all here. Um, well, we may be welcoming Ileana back, but she comes very often. Uh, Lech Valenza hasn't been back, and I was a freshman Congress member when I heard him come to the Congress the first time 30 years ago. Thirty years ago, um, we all watched <clears throat> with surprise and jubilation at the fall of the Berlin Wall. For decades, the symbol of repression and tyranny that had fallen over all the states behind the Iron Curtain. As it happens, as I just mentioned, that was the, my very first year as a member of Congress, still a member of this committee all these years, but member of Congress of the first year. And what followed the fall of the wall was the collapse of the totalitarian regimes and the restoration of those countries to their place among the world's democracies. In November of 1989, and again, that was my first year in Congress, a humble electrician from the working class Polish city of Gdansk spoke before a joint session of the United States Congress. And I remember it well. He described his years long struggle for freedom and asked for support from the United States. And that man, of course, was soon to be President Valesa. Now, I must be honest with, with the, the president and tell him that I have a picture with him, but I couldn't find it. <laughs> we searched every closet, and I'm sure tomorrow morning we'll find it. I'll send it to you for an autograph. Um, more than anyone else, President Valesa helped us understand the heroic and honorable fight that the people of Poland and others throughout Central and Eastern Europe were waging to win their freedom over dictatorship. We understood that the people of Europe needed our help in the struggle for freedom, and U.S. support was indeed critical in helping those countries transition to democracy. Thirty years later, some of those countries need our help again. While the specter of communism has faded, many countries in Central and Eastern Europe face renewed threats to democracy. Today, at a hearing of the European Subcommittee and of our Foreign Affairs Committee, and I heard it was a great, a great hearing. President Valesa and other experts described some of these new threats in countries like Poland, Hungary, and Turkey, where increasingly authoritarian leaders are undermining democracy and the rule of law. We owe it to President Valesa and all the others who continue to fight for democracy in the region to show our support. So I want to close by thanking all of you for being here. The National Endowment for Democracy has done great work through the years. Thank you for all the work you do. And I want to thank President Valesa for visiting with us today. 
I want to urge everyone in this room that we can best honor President Valesa's legacy by continuing the fight against authoritarianism wherever we may find it. And we will all work together for a better world. It's not easy, it's difficult, but we know it has to be done, and it has to be done by people of goodwill. I, I, will, I will tell you that before I was in Congress, I served in the New York State Assembly uh, in Albany, New York, and I just remember what, getting newspaper after newspaper talking about what was going on in Gdansk and what was going on in Poland, and really felt an identification because when you see people struggling for their freedom and actually winning the fight, it, it's really something that's, that's mind-changing, that's life-changing, that's, that's a cause that we all know is important and we all want to believe in. So, President Valesa, thank you so much, and thank you all for coming here this evening. Thank you, Congressman Engel, for carrying on and supporting the struggle for freedom around the world. We really appreciate it. And now it's my additional pleasure to introduce the distinguished senator from Idaho, Jim Risch, who is also the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And he's the co-founder and co-chair of the Senate Caucus on Poland has a deep interest in this, and he introduced a bipartisan resolution commemorating the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the democracy that followed and the need to continue to support that democracy. It's an enormous pleasure uh, for me to introduce Senator Risch and also to let him know how important it is that you are with us on this occasion. Thank you, Senator. Well, thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. Elliot, thank you for making your, uh, your room available to us. I, I've never been in this room before. My goodness, there's a lot of seats here. I, uh... <laughs> thank you. I'm glad to be here. Uh, and, and thank you to the uh, National Endowment for Democracy uh, it, uh, for taking the time and energy uh, to put together this, uh, this reception. I think it's incredibly important that we mark the 30th anniversary of Polish democracy, and I'm glad uh, that uh, Elliot has made this room available to us and gotten us all together here uh, for this celebration. Another item, Elliot, you know, on my committee, not quite half, but almost half of my members are either running for president or have run for president. <laughs> so we hear some very eloquent speeches in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Anyway, thank you. Uh, I'd like uh, to take a moment and wish my Polish friends a happy Independence Day, even though it's a couple of days late. And I especially want to wish a happy Independence Day to my Polish wife, Vicky. <laughs> Vicky's... Uh, Vicky's grandmother uh, was uh, Maryszewski, which I understand is a Polish name. I'm, in any event, uh, I'm honored to be a co-chairman of the caucus and being a founding member of this caucus. Uh, and I'm so honored to be here tonight uh, alongside Nobel Prize winner, uh, President Lech Valenza. He's certainly an inspiration to all of us. Uh, and I'm glad to be here with this terrific group of speakers that, uh, that we have today. Uh, like President Walensa's story and the story of the Solidarity Movement is a great one. And as we look back at the events of 1989 and 1990, this story represents all of the citizens across the former Soviet Union who risked their property and, more importantly, their lives uh, to gain their freedom. Poland was a leader in Europe's fight for freedom, and in 1980, President uh, Walensa founded Solidarity, the first independent union in a communist country. After surviving years of repression, Solidarity won Poland's first semi-free parliamentary elections in the summer of 1989. We now know that election was a huge blow to the Soviet Union and presaged the end of the USSR. Earlier this month, as been noted previously, I introduced a resolution commemorating the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the rise of democracy in Eastern Europe. My hope is, and was when I introduced that, that this resolution not only celebrates the hard-fought democracy in Eastern Europe, but it encourages activists around the world to keep pushing. 
as we see today in Hong Kong, in Venezuela, in Russia, freedom and democracy will be achievable for these people, but sometimes it's when you least expect it. But as we celebrate this anniversary, we must not forget that dem democracy is never finished. You don't just attain it and then claim victory. It is a work ongoing, a constant adjustment in changing times. Neither Poland nor the United States of America can claim that our work is finished. And anyone who doesn't believe that needs only to look at our neighbor Venezuela. They at one time enjoyed a robust democracy. And look what they have today and how quickly that changed. I'm proud of the strides that uh, Poland and its Eastern European neighbors have made. And I thank all of the people that gave up so much to create a better world for their children and their grandchildren and really for the world. God bless you all. God bless the United States of America. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. We've got to excuse us. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Who really, with President Reagan, was the founder of the NED. There's a portrait of Ileana over there, and Henry Hyde, and so many others who are wonderful friends of ours. And now I'm going to, you know, introduce Chris Smith, who's the co-chair of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. And there's Tom Lantos over there. This room is really, you know, at the core of the U.S. commitment to democracy and freedom in the world. And Chris Smith, congressman from New Jersey, has been a fighter, a real fighter over the years. We've worked together, how long, Chris? Three, 35, 40 years. I mean, he's a fighter. Uh, on all the key issues, China especially, but everything. Uh, you can count on him. It's just a great pleasure to have you with us tonight, Chris. Carl, thank you very much, and thank you for the leadership of Ned and your personal leadership. Uh, you are one of a kind when it comes to being an advocate, and I want to thank you for that leadership that you've provided all these years. Um, you know, today we do celebrate Poland's historic democratic breakthrough 30 years ago that led to the matriculation from dictatorship to democracy. Today we honor the bravery, the tenacity, the discipline, the innate goodness of Nobel Peace Prize winner Lech Walesa and the great organization, the labor organization that he led, Solidarity. You know, I got elected in 1980 with Ronald Reagan. We always looked up to this man and couldn't believe what he was accomplishing uh, against all odds. So I want to thank him for that leadership. It is extraordinary. Some t years ago, almost 20 years ago, I read Lech Walesa's powerful autobiography. It was called A Way of Hope. Filled with insight and brutally honest, the book walks the reader through a series of volatile events, personal and public, that have literally transformed the world. In the book, we get a glimpse into Lech Walesa's deep faith in God and the role his beloved mother and her Catholic beliefs had on him. He writes, neighbors came to our house to say the rosary, he tells us in the book, and the book is filled with remembrance of family and his great devotion to his wife. On leadership, he tells us, I never wished or prepared for leadership. Paradoxically, it's because I never really wanted it, absorbed as I was in quite different concerns, different problems which needed solving that I found myself out in front of leading others, leading the flock, if you will. So he didn't expect to be where he was, but because of the need, the compelling need, he rose to the occasion. In the chapter, The Strike and the August Agreement, he tells us how the movement had matured. Until then, I had been talking, bluffing, playing on credit. Although we pretended to be holding all the cards, our opponents knew our game inside and out. They've been playing against us for years. But what they didn't know was the nature of our very last card, the determination that we had been maturing for 10 years since the death of three of our colleagues right in front of the entrance to the shipyard. When His Holiness, when His Holiness, um, uh, when Pope John Paul II came uh, to his homeland in 1979, he counseled and he even admonished 
his countrymen and countrywomen, be not afraid. And in the book, I won't go into detail, but in the book, Lech Walesa talks about when the Pope was shot in 1981, May 13th and 14th, when they got the news, he was in Nagasaki and was greatly disturbed because his lodestar, as he had pointed out, may, was lost because the first reports that went out was that the Pope had been killed. And then those, obviously, those, those reports were corrected and that hope was rekindled. In the chapter on martial law, Lech Lester tells us how they decided that if the militia invaded the shipyard during the night, they decided on passive resistance. Quote, our great strength is precisely our weakness, our living bodies in empty hands confronting tanks and night sticks. His wife, Danuta, writes in the book how she was discouraged when he was locked up during martial law. But then she says, he seemed rather pleasant. <laughs> Even in those circumstances, we had, had to be dignified about it all. Even in a, place, in a place like this, we still had the upper hand, and we, we, not they, were making history. By 1989, solidarity leaders sat across the table from General Yaruzelski, the same general who had imposed martial law in 1981. And they negotiated what seemed to be the most impossible against all the odds the peaceful transition from communism to free and fair elections. In August of 1989, less than a decade after the Gdansk shipyard strikes that gave birth to solidarity, Poland would elect its first non-communist prime minister since the communist takeover. And then Lech Walesa himself became president. In his early years, he says in the book that history was not, was his weak point. I would suggest that studying history does not matter that much when you are the one who makes history by bringing freedom, respect for human rights, enduring democracy, not only to your own country, but to so many other nations around the world. Thank you, Lech Walesa. It's now my pleasure, I'm a resident of Maryland, I want you to know, it's now my pleasure to introduce the congressman from the first district of Maryland, Andy Harris, who's a member of the, a very important voice on the House Appropriations Committee, and he's serving the people of Maryland and his country. He has served as a physician, as a naval officer, as a state senator, and now as a U.S. congressman. His commitment to the struggle for democracy in Central Europe is something that is deeply personal, both his parents fled communism, escaped the Iron Curtain to start a new life here in the United States. He understands the profound historical repercussions of Poland's transition to democracy and what you achieved, Lech, in ending that system of oppression. And it's just an enormous honor for me this evening to introduce Congressman Andy Harris. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, you're right, for me, it is personal because my parents did escape totalitarianism. And as I frequently say, Americans uh, sometimes don't appreciate that democracy doesn't exist everywhere in the world. In fact, when I do town hall meetings, I frequently at the end will say, this is what's great about this country. Someone can come in and criticize a public official and not leave in handcuffs that night. But that's the way it is in a lot, large part of the world. And that's the way it was when Lech Walesa was in Poland. The bottom line is that 30 years ago, 31 years ago, I was getting commissioned as a naval officer, never to imagine how quickly after that the dominoes would fall and in fact democracy would take root in Central and Eastern Europe, but it did. And earlier this year, I had the privilege of going with uh, Senator Wicker to make history once again in Gdansk as the Helsinki Commission held its very first overseas hearing ever in Gdansk to discuss the threat of Russia. Now history does repeat itself if we let it repeat itself. And as the chairman had said, 30 years ago, a threat from the east was faced, and we once again see the same threat from the east. 
And once again, the people in Central and Eastern Europe are going to have to resist that threat and preserve democracy. I also had the privilege of attending the European Solidarity Center, a wonderful museum in Gdansk. Unfortunately, Gdansk is kind of off the beaten track for a lot of people who visit Europe. But I tell them, go there, see that museum. Put your message on that wall at the, at the end of the tour where you have the wall with messages to the people of Poland, thanking them for what they have done for the world and freedom and democracy. God bless you all, and God bless the United States. Thank you, Congressman. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce a very, very dear friend and a member of the NED board who was formerly the chair of the, of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and her portrait is over there. Ileana Rosletinen is a great, great freedom fighter. Uh, she was born in Cuba in a totalitarian country, and she was only eight when, uh, when the Castro's, when she fled, her family fled uh, the Castro regime. And she's been fighting for a free Cuba, a Cuba Libre, and it will be a Cuba Libre. We're just waiting and we're gonna do everything we can to help. But she also fights for freedom all over the world. I think before you retired, you were in Tibet, you were in Dharamsala with the Dalai Lama. She's a freedom fighter for everybody all over the world. And it's just an enormous honor for us to have her on, on the NED board and to have her speak with us tonight. Ileana. You're so kind to me, Carl, thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, what a thrill it is uh, for me to be on the NED board and uh, uh, to be here on this very special occasion. Uh, thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to be here with all of you, uh, freedom lovers, each and every one of you, to, to celebrate the democratic movement in Poland, which would not, did not begin uh, 30 years ago, but which heroically threw off the yoke of totalitarian communism 30 years ago, threw off the control of this authoritarian government, which invaded Poland in 1939 in cooperation with Hitler's Germany under the infamous Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, and all of us who study history know that all too well. Poland has a long, rich history of surviving and reviving despite the vicissitudes of a cruel world. And it was Karol Josef Wojtyla, I don't know if I'm saying that right, as Chris Smith pointed out, Pope John Paul II, who, uh, from Poland, who bravely reminded Poles and the world, be not afraid. And those were words that moved uh, so many in the freedom movement. And in 1989, the solidarity movement in Poland, thank you, Sandy, for giving this to me, was an inspiration to both the free and the oppressed throughout the world. And in particular, I spoke of solidarity as an inspiration in my first congressional campaign in uh, September in that same year of 1989. And th since then, my husband and I have always shown the solidarity symbol so that the new generation does not forget in our classes on the Cold War and in the class we have jointly on Congress and American foreign policy. We've got to teach the young people about the history of what went on so we can celebrate the present and cherish the new tomorrow. And while I am certain that the Polish people are justly proud of their 1989 accomplishments, I'm also certain that the Polish people do not fully recognize how inspirational their actions were to the rest of the world. And I know when, uh, as a little Cuban girl who came over here, as Carl said, when I was only eight, and I got to sit in the United States Congress a uh, uh, bunch of years later and got to hear these words in that joint session of Congress, and I had to pinch myself and say, is this a great country or what? What an inspiration your movement and you have been to enslaved and oppressed people everywhere. Muchísimas gracias, amigo. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. You're great. I love you, amigo. Thank you, Ileana. And now it's a, it's a great pleasure to introduce 
Lege Professor Leszek Balcerowicz, who as Deputy Prime Minister of Poland in 1990 was the architect, who as Deputy Prime Minister of Poland in 1990 was the architect of the, of the economic reforms that really were responsible for Poland's success. And I think I just want to note how important it was that when he did that, and it was not uncontroversial, he had the support of Lech Wałęsa. And that shows, I think, the leadership of Lech Wałęsa in supporting what you did back then and to work together now for the good of democracy. Thank you. For the good of democracy in Poland. And Leszek Balcerowicz now heads the Civic, the Civic Development Forum and is working uh, to try to move Poland forward in its democracy. The, democ the struggle for democracy never ends and he's continuing that struggle today. And he'll be giving a big lecture tomorrow at our conference. Anyone who's here who wants to come, please come. Uh, but he'll speak to us now briefly about Lech Wałęsa. Leszek. Thank you very much, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen. Successful democratic and market reforms require two conditions to be met. First, a group, a team, of competent and determined reformers. There are no reforms without reformers. But second, sufficiently strong external support. <clears throat> and speaking about support, I would like to thank very much and to praise the role of the United States, of the successive president and the administrations of, of the American people. I remember the best, the first heroic period of Poland's reforms, between 89 and 91, and I remember very well the contribution of the US president, President Bush Senior, <coughs> and his team in helping us, especially in getting unprecedented debt reduction. We both struggled for debt reduction, President Owens and myself, and let me tell you that without the support of American administration, we would not get it would be very, very difficult, if not impossible, for example, to, to persuade Japanese to reduce that what we've got it. And it greatly helped us with the economic development of Poland, reforms and uh, debt reduction. Let me end by saying how important it is for the world for democracies and for countries who want to be, which want to be democratic, that the United States continues to play a role of indispensable defender of the values of freedom. And this would be and the greatest expression of solidarity. Thank you very much. <clears throat> We've now come to the moment where we're going to say thank you to Lech Wałęsa. And we've asked another member of the NED board to say this thank you. He's very, very articulate. Dan Fried, who was ambassador to Poland, who played a critical role in designing and implementing American policy in Europe after the fall of the Soviet Union. And he crafted the policy of NATO enlargement and also advancing the goal of a Europe that is whole, free, and at peace. Then is on the NED board, he follows all of our work in Eurasia, which is Russia, the Caucasus, and Central Asia. He's deeply, deeply committed to the struggle for freedom. He now heads the Future Europe Initiative and the Dina Petrescu Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. Dan Fried. Thank you, Carl. Panie Prezydencie, dobry wieczór. Państwu, dobry wieczór. Um, panie Premierze, three, trzy krótkie uwagi, three short observations. First, the Berlin Wall fell because communism had already fallen in Poland. Someone, some country had to break free first. And that was the most dangerous time for that first country. We look back and the fall of communism looks inevitable. 
Yeah, trust me. At the time, it was seen as impossible. And solidarity was regarded, and I'm not particularly proud of this, but was regarded as noble but hopeless. Another Polish hopeless powstanie, <laughs> right? And, and, and it was regarded as such by many Poles. It was risky. The communists had all the guns in 1989. That's the second observation. It was dangerous. It was not easy. It was not inevitable. It could have ended badly. Like all the other revolts in Eastern Europe had ended badly with a lot of dead people. And then, third observation, after communism fell, then the hard part began, right? Lech Wałęsa said, and I remember, that communism was like turning an aquarium into fish soup. It's easy. Anybody can do it. <laughs> but democracy, that's like turning the fish soup back into an aquarium. <laughs> little, little more skill required. And that's where Leszek Balcerowicz comes in. And Leszek Balcerowicz, you, you can debate Terapia Szokowa. I mean, there's a debate in Poland now, but basically, the way I saw it at the time and see it now, Leszek Balcerowicz and Lech Wałęsa were betting on the Polish people. I mean, that was a big bet, right? Nobody had overthrown communism before. So there was no body of knowledge, there was no science to post-communist transformation because nobody expected it would ever happen. They bet on the Polish people to step up. And they did. And it worked. We can debate the pluses and minuses. But for God's sakes, has anybody been to Warsaw recently? We know what it looks like. It's a miracle. Cud na wismo. Na prawda. So what's the conclusion? That was, I was looking back. What do we do looking ahead? This is not a very optimistic time. Politics in, in America? I mean, what can I say? I, I won't say anything. <laughs> okay. But also, politics in Poland. W Warszawie czujesz się jak u siebie i nie w dobrym sensie. It's... You know, it's divided politics. But that's where leadership comes in. Not just any kind of leadership. Leadership in the service of higher values. The dictators say that their time has come again. And let's be clear about, you know, who we mean. Vladimir Putin thinks his time has come and the future belongs to him and to strong men like him. And we are not so sure of our own values right now. That's where leadership matters. Yeah, now we look, okay, Lechvo went over through communism and solidarity was great. Yeah, that's how we look at it now, but when it all began in the 1970s, it was hopeless. The time to invest in our values is when it's tough. So let's remember how much we achieved 30 years ago and how risky it was. And then draw faith. And then what Jan Pavel II said, be not afraid, can inspire us all. So, May God bless Poland and the United States and the values which unite us. Thank you. We're going to give the award after Congressman Kapsu. Right. Ben, that was beautiful. That was a great speech with very, very profound and important insights.
and I'm going to call you back in a moment when we're going to give Lech Wałęsa our tribute, but Congressman Marcy Kaptur has arrived, and we're going to give her a chance to speak. She too, she too is a member of the Appropriations Committee, and she helps lead the Congressional Ukraine Caucus, the Congressional Caucus on Poland, the Congressional Hungarian Caucus, and the Victims of Communism Caucus. She's been a defender of Ukraine against aggression from Russia, and her district in Ohio, of course, has many Ukrainian Americans. Her maternal grandparents were born in Poland and lived in a tiny Ukrainian village near the Polish border before coming to the United States in 1912. And she tra has traveled to Ukraine 10 times, beginning in 1973, when she and her mother rented a car and drove through Czechoslovakia and Poland, then under, of course, communist control, to find out more about their ancestors, including where her grandparents lived. And her journey has led her to see firsthand the perils of communism. And she has been a great, great friend of the Polish struggle for freedom. And it's a great honor, Congresswoman Kapta, to have you with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. President, to the entire delegation from Poland, to my dear friend, Chris Smith. I see that former Congressman Dennis Hertel uh, from the state of Michigan is with us this evening. Uh, Mr. Freed, for your unending love of liberty, uh, for being here this evening, and to all those who have joined us. Uh, Mr. Balsarovich did not remember I met him in 1989 uh, in uh, Warsaw when then Congressman John LaFalse led a congressional delegation, and Poland was just beginning to take the reins of the future in its own hands. And I remember how you were criticized for being disciplined on the financial side. And then to look at what has happened in Poland over the last quarter century, a nation that knew how to balance its accounts. We have a lot to learn uh, in our country. And uh, to uh, become an economic as well as a defense powerhouse uh, in Europe. But that's not enough. Uh, if we look at our own country, uh, for each of us uh, who are the progeny of those who, whose futures were limited because of the political systems from which they uh, emerged, uh, we have a special responsibility. Indeed, Mr. Gershman, you mentioned about my maternal grandparents. It has taken us over half a century to figure out what exactly happened in the villages from which they came. And uh, through wonderful people in Ohio who traveled to Ukraine this year working with archivists from Yale University and uh, the Cleveland Ukrainian American Museum uh, and archives there, uh, we learned that the church in which our grandmother was married, uh, the basement of that church uh, which has largely been walled off to the public for decades and decades. Over 160 individuals who were of the Roman Catholic faith were walled behind a wall in the basement and were then sealed in and starved to death, lined up like logs, 169 of them. And it has taken me over half a century to figure this out. And they came home with photos and with personal testimonials. And I can tell you, I am just as one American who happens to be a congresswoman, so utterly committed uh, to the future of liberty in our country and across the world. Um, obviously, I'm a Democrat, but I have to say I've never seen a president of the United States that didn't stand up to Russian aggression, be they Republican or Democrat. And um, what I am seeing in our country today, I do not recognize by the top leaders of this country. And the American people are so much better than this. And they have given so much for liberty. So I'm very optimistic. I'm very optimistic that, in fact, democratic republics can make mistakes and that they will correct those mistakes and that the younger generation will learn from us. So it is a great honor to be here on this 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, and in the presence of a statesman and dissident and union organizer and Nobel Peace Prize laureate. 
I want to thank the National Endowment for Democracy for hosting this event and for playing such an important role in helping our country be a part of the future of advancing liberty halfway across the world. There's so much to say, and I know that the program has been very long this evening. But as an American of Polish heritage, who represents literally 100,000 individuals of Polish, Polish extraction across northern Ohio, I am keenly aware of Poland's heroic struggle. Indeed, it has been the struggle of my own family. And uh, despite experiencing dismemberment in the 1700s and again during World War II, the Poles love of liberty simply could not be suppressed. And one of my dearest friends, who is no longer living, who fought in the Polish cavalry and then was in the underground during World War II, um, and whose daughter was the valedictorian of our high school class, took me on his last trip to Poland in 2009. It was one of the two greatest journeys of my life. And he began to show me what his life was like. And it took us to Auschwitz, where he had been imprisoned because of his work in the underground, where his colleague, who had moved to Germany during the war, World War II, had been beheaded. And a letter that she sent uh, to him in Poland arrived, and he began to be sought out uh, by the Gestapo. He um, somehow survived a death sentence at Auschwitz but ended up in Gross Rosen and Leitmeritz and escaped at the end of World War II. His wife, who he did not know during the war, met her in a uh, displaced persons camp in Germany after World War II, uh, lost her entire family at Paviak prison, where she was the Girl Scout leader and the spiritual leader of the women there for which she would have been killed had they known it. So these people have told me their stories and have shared their lives with me, and they became American citizens. And what has truly touched my heart is that though they were American citizens, they are not remembered here because they weren't part of the US military. They actually had been in the Polish military and Polish organizations, and that their heroic struggle will be lost unless we tell those stories. So I'm always looking for ways to link the United States and Poland, the real experience of our people. And I would hope that some of you here tonight could help me build a path for liberty across Poland and remember some of these stories and remind the younger generation of Poland as well as the United States of what the cost of liberty truly is. The favorite expression of my favorite cavalryman always was, freedom means never surrender, never. And I thought, what a lesson. What a lesson for our own people and what a lesson for the future. Let me just end by saying this. Um, in the early, about oh, 14 years ago, I visited with the visionary mayor of Gdańsk, Poland, Pavel Adamowicz, when I was on a journey to Poland. And I was very deeply impacted personally by his death, his tragic death at Gdańsk. And knowing the history of Gdańsk, I really think that we as the free world ought to find a way to building from that tragedy, engage freedom-loving people everywhere, and build a path of liberty across Poland. Maybe the government can't do it, but people like myself would donate if we could find a worthy expression of the sacrifice of those who gave us the liberty that we possess. And I wanted to come here this evening to put that challenge out there. Maybe we plant trees all along a certain path Maybe we remember our own families because, frankly, the family I described to you, their story is not told here in the United States and it's not told in Poland, but they paid the price for us and their story should not be lost. And I dare say there are tens of thousands of Americans and Canadians who share similar stories. So my remarks tonight are partly a challenge. I'm someone who serves on our Defense Appropriations Committee and is a strong voice for continuing NATO funding and uh, engagement of Poland as well as Hungary, and we know the challenge is great. But 
um, I am someone who supports Poland and her, her highest aspirations. And I know that working together, we can do even more as God gives us breath to breathe. Thank you so very much, and congratulations to all. Thank you, Congressman. And I just, you know, you remind me, Congresswoman, that we gave our democracy award in 1989 to Jacek Kuran. And Jacek Kuran, at a rally in Poland in 1980, said something important. He said that a free Poland needs a free Ukraine. That's what he said. Jacek Kuran said that. Uh, and it reminds me also that in 1830, the Polish movement for independence were supporting the Decembrists in Russia, and they had a slogan. And I think that slogan that they coined, which has been the slogan that was held by protesters in, in the, before the Kremlin in 1968 in defense of the struggle in Czechoslovakia and many, many other struggles. The slogan is, for our freedom and yours, for our common future, for our freedom and yours, for our common future. And that's what it is. We have to be for the freedom of everyone because we have a common future and we will be for the freedom of everyone and this country will be for the freedom of everyone in Ukraine and everywhere else. Dan, come up and give this. This is, by the way, Tom Marsh did this. This is a woodcut of the goddess of democracy, which is the statue that was put up in Tiananmen Square before the tanks came in on June 4th. 1989, by the way, I think it's worth noting that the election in Poland, the breakthrough election, was June 4th, 1989, the very same day that the tanks rolled in to Tiananmen Square and destroyed this statue. It's quite important, and that this is the gift and the award that we want to give to Lane Kirkland, to Lane Kirkland, to Lech Walesa. <laughs> Come over here. Panie i Panowie, Szanowni Państwo. Ladies and gentlemen, nie przypuszczałem, że tu usłyszę tyle pięknych, wspaniałych słów. I was not really expecting that I would hear so many beautiful words here. <laughs> tyle wiadomości, takich wiadomości to chyba żaden inny kraj nie ma, jak, jak właśnie nad w Stanach, w Polsce. Uh, so much knowledge, uh, knowing so much about Poland, I don't think it happens anywhere else uh, than, uh, other than the United States. <laughs> but I, I could have anticipated that there may be you, have, you would have gone further and you, you could all uh, be able to speak Polish. Then my situation would be much easier, but you haven't. Szanowni Państwo, ja się zastanawiałem, Skąd tyle problemów ta Polska światu stwarza? I was just wondering how, how come that Poland has been producing so many troubles to the whole world? A problem jest prosty, środek Europy. But I know the answer, it's pretty simple. It's because we are located in the center of Europe. Między dwoma wielkimi narodami, Rosja i Niemcy. Uh, between two powerful nations, Russia and Germany. Jak wiecie, to są takie turystyczno-militarne narody. As you may know, that they are people who enjoy military socializing. And obviously, back then, when they enjoyed that military socializing, uh, the technology was not very much advanced, so they would always take the shortest way, which was across Poland. Obviously, it was across the, the, the country. And once they had entered Poland, they would look around saying, oh, what a lovely country. Why don't we stay on for longer? Which they did. 
Zostaliśmy bardzo mocno przetrenowani przez jednych i przez drugich. And I guess by living at that very location we were really trained tough by the ones and then the others. Nauczyliśmy się przez te doświadczenia wyczuwać co się będzie działo ze światem. And I guess that through that experience we learned how to anticipate future developments in the world. Inne narody nie musiały tego czynić, no bo nie miały takich zagrożeń. I guess other nations did they have to do that because they didn't face similar threats. Starsi pamiętają, a młodzież niech zobaczy do książek. Some senior citizens can still remember it from their own experience. Younger ones can check it in history books. My przed drugą wojną światową ostrzegaliśmy świat. We had tried to warn the world before the outbreak of the Second World War. Mówiłeś, wojna się zbliża. We were saying the war is imminent. A co świat nam And what did we hear in response? No, sprawa lokalna, nie będziemy ginąć za Gdańsk. Oh, it's merely a local conflict, they said. We're not going to die for Danzig. Ale kiedy wojna doszła do Londynu, do Paryża, przypomniano sobie dopiero polskie ostrzeżenie. And actually when the war uh, reached London, the world did remember the Polish warning. Podobnie było na koniec wojny światowej. And a similar thing happened at the end of the Second World War. We were trying to make the world realize that Stalin was tricking the world, that he was about to install communism throughout half of the globe. And it took us 50 years to get rid of that regime. Stalin przy takich różnych spotkaniach pośmiewał się, kiedy wypił sobie trochę, mówię, Komunizm na Polakach leży jak końskie siodło na świnie założone. And you know, Stalin uh, himself found it extremely funny that he had succeeded in doing that. So after a drink or two, he would say that communism fits Poland like a horse saddle put on a pig. Szanowni Państwo, ale to przeszłość. But that's already over in the past. Ale co my dzisiaj mówimy? And how about today's warnings that we have for the world? Maybe this time the world will listen to us? Nasze pokolenie dostało przez zbieg okoliczności dwa duże zadania. Through the vicissitudes and coincidence, our generation uh, was given two major tasks to accomplish. Pierwsze zadanie skończyć te wielkie, niebezpieczne, niewygodne podziały świata. The first was to put the end to those deep and dangerous divisions in the world. I to naprawdę nam się udało. Temu pokoleniu się to udało. And we really did succeed in doing that. This generation succeeded in winning that victory. Ile w tym pokoleniu tych podziałów niedobrych odrzuciliśmy. And during the lifespan of our generation, we have eliminated so many bad, deep divisions. Obviously, um, the technological advancement was a great help to us. Kiedy nasi pradziadowie wymyślili rower i trochę technologii, to z różnych osad zrobili kraje państwa. When our forefathers invented a bike, out of villages and settlements, they organized themselves in countries. I to trwało do końca XX wieku mniej więcej takie zorganizowanie. And the organization uh, structures as states and countries were quite effective until the end of the 20th century. Jak my wymyśliliśmy samoloty, internety, komputery, to musimy zrobić większe struktury i to nam pomaga w rozwiązywaniu problemów. And you know, now when we have invented uh, jets and um, inter the internet and um, other technologies, the uh, computers, uh, this is really helping us enlarging the structures in which we are organizing ourselves. Ale tamte podziały wytworzyły swoją, swoje rozwiązania, swoje, swoje struktury. But you know that old divided world established its own structures, its own organizations. Kiedy my zburzyliśmy tamten porządek, musimy zbudować nowe. Which goes to say that once we had demolished the old order of the world, we also need to establish new structures and institutions. The United States is a huge country, 
Meanwhile, Europe is lots of small countries. And it's perfect that we have uh, eliminated uh, borders with, uh, within uh, Europe. It's a great job. We have introduced a single currency within Europe, that is Euro. I think it's high time we started thinking of global dollar. A więc daleko posunęliśmy się w tym pokoleniu. Which goes to say we have made a lot of progress in uh, during our lifetime. Ale moim zdaniem doszliśmy tym razem do ściany już. But I'm afraid that we have really reached a cul-de-sac and we cannot progress any further. Stanęliśmy przed wielkimi pytaniami. Unless we find answers to major questions. Jaki fundament tej nowej budowy? Uh, the first being what should serve as the foundation of this new structure we want to establish in the world. Uh, and at the moment, looking at Europe, for example, and European integration, uh, I guess that this foundation should be found for the continent. Once we find this foundation for the continent, maybe it can serve well as the foundation for the whole globe. Oczywiście drugie pytanie, jaki jest system ekonomiczny przed Europą? Obviously, the inevitable follow-up question is what should serve as the best economic system for Europe? Na pewno wolno rynek, wolny rynek, to jest jasne. Certainly, we don't want to give up uh, the free market. This is absolutely essential. Ale filozofia kapitalizmu, która polegała na tym, że wyścig szczurów między państwami However, this attitude of uh, capitalism that was a, bit, a little bit like a rat's race, one country competing against the other. Uh, implied quite a lot of um, a different attitudes, like we didn't care about our neighbors, uh, we didn't care about people being unemployed. The new attitude, however, has uh, overcome it all, and that means we're not going to fight and compete anymore. That means half of the content of the concept of capitalism is over too. Stary podział uczynił imperium dobra, stany imperium z jak zła komunizm związek sowiecki. You know, when we used to have the divisions in the world, we then had the evil empire, and by that token also the good empire, which was the United States versus the USSR. To się that is over too. Pytanie, jaka rola and under the circumstances, the question arises, what should be the role of the United States? Bez, Back then, this role was unquestionable. The United States is to be the leader of the world. Today we are having doubts regarding that leadership. But I foresee real dangers to the world unless we do have the leadership of the United States to the world. So therefore, here I am to beg you, to ask you, to, jest nowa epoka. to realize that the, we are really witnessing a beginning of a totally new era. Każdy rozwiązania starej epoki nie pasują do tej epoki. Which goes to say that in no sphere of our life the old solutions are suitable in the new era. Każdy temat możemy wziąć, rozpatrzeć tu i udowodnię Państwu, że nie pasuje na dzisiaj życia. So no matter which aspect of our life we discuss, I can demonstrate to you that the old solutions are not suitable anymore. Nawet demokracja nie pasuje na te czasy stara demokracja. Even the old concept of democracy is unsuitable for today's world. Coraz bardziej to widać. Which we can see more and more clearly. Demokrację mnie uczono 70 lat temu, że demokracja jest po stronie większości, z większością. 70 years back, uh, I was taught that democracy was uh, where the majority went. Dziś w wielu państwach większość nie chodzi na wybory, a więc gdzie jest demokracja? Meanwhile, in many countries, uh, uh, not many people uh, participate in the election. The turnout is really low. So where is democracy? A zapamiętajcie, że tak będzie, jeśli nie poprawimy tego, to za 20-30 lat będą chodzić na wybory tylko ci, co kandydują. 
And I foresee that uh, in 30 years from now, if we continue with that attitude, uh, the only people going to elect, uh, to take part in the election, will be those running for the offices, only them. So we will continue electing uh, worse and worse individuals, less and less clever. Because the rest will be fr too frustrated to participate in elections. Therefore, my <laughs> great appeal, the United States, please take on the leadership to the world. And wherever you're trying hard to do it, uh, you can count on me. And if you're not willing to continue with your leadership position, give it to Poland. We will know how to handle it. Don't worry. Szanowni Państwo, kończąc. Pierwsze zadanie wykonaliśmy. To conclude. Uh, we have accomplished the first task. We have fulfilled it. But the second task remaining is even more challenging. You can see on the example of the United States and on, other, uh, on the examples of other countries throughout the world that there is a great sense of, of the need for change. And people simply elect those individuals who promise that they will bring the change about. And I would even say further that those individuals elected, uh, promising uh, that they would solve the change, have a very good diagnosis of the situation. They know which uh, Things do need change. But the treatment that they apply to the problems and the solutions they want to give to the problems are inaccurate. But we are happy that they are there because they force us to look for the solutions uh, to the issues that do require these solutions. So if we really th thoroughly look at things and put our solutions together, I'm sure that we will have a better world. And let me take one, uh, once more this opportunity to use this um, podium to thank the United States and the American people for all the support that we have been given all the way along. God bless America and God bless Poland.